It's my pleasure as the new CEO of the BIH to welcome you all to today's BIH online lecture uh, of Michael Potente, our new BIH professor for translational vascular biomedicine on metabolic aspects of angiogenesis in physiology and disease. Now, uh, Michael Potente has a CV that is almost an ideal CV of a physician scientist. Uh, Born 1976 in Aachen, he studied medicine in Frankfurt and Toronto and soon developed a strong interest in cardiology where he also got his Dr. Mate uh, title in 2003 uh, with the highest uh, degree and also at that time with his first scientific award. Um, uh, continuously, he developed a dual career in medicine and science. Um, he had a full training as in internal medicine and cardiology, which he finished uh, with the specialist exam in 2011. And then he, he uh, switched uh, um, uh, more to the science field and uh, continued his career at the Max Planck Institute for Heart and Lung Research in Bad Nauheim, one of the best places, I think, in this country to develop a career as a physician scientist. Actually, at that time, um, one of his Im important mentors was, was and continues to be Thomas Brown. And that is something that the two of us have in common, because also my very first step into molecular medicine started with a contact to Thomas Brown. And uh, he is really a highly influential person in this field. Now, um, his subsequent uh, scientific career is highly impressive. Um, in the past 10 years, there's a continuous um, track record of publications at the highest possible level, including many highly cited papers. Um, accordingly, he also received um, prestigious grants, uh, not only from the DFT, but also from the Leduc Foundation, among others and uh, both uh, starting and consolidator grants of the European Research Council. Furthermore, he became a member and also a steering board member of the Cluster of Excellence on, cardio, on the Cardiopulmonary Diseases um, in Frankfurt and uh, Gießen and uh, was one of the crucial people behind the continued success of this Cluster of Excellence. Um, he received further awards since uh, the one that he got for the thesis. Uh, the most recent was the Arthur Weber Prize of the German Cardiac Society. So he's highly visible also in the clinical arena with his research contributions. His research topic is really vascular um, development, vascular heterogeneity and cellular specification. And this is a fascinating topic because it's relevant for almost each and every organ in the human body. It's as relevant during embryonic and fetal development as it continues to be during um, childhood and adult life. And also, of course, during disease development and remodeling in disease recovery. Um, his specific interest is expressed in his talk, exactly the connection of metabolism, vascular specification and that with this deep knowledge into the pathways behind all these decisions um, opens numerous options also for translational interventions. Um, when he came to Berlin, um, now this summer this year as a full professor with the BIH and also of course deeply connected with the Max Dielbrück Center where he will work um, in the future Kete, Kete Beutler House. Um, he already had ha has had a strong ties to Berlin before since 2016. He's a visiting professor of the BIH, and there are also, when you look career track, a strong interactions with uh, strong people here in Berlin for many years. Um, Michael Potente is highly committed to both continue his excellent basic research, uh, which, as I said, opens many opportunities for translational developments and to further increase uh, also the interactions with the clinical cardiology arena and also other organ fields here at the Charité. And I think he's also a perfect person to mentor uh, new generations of clinician scientists. Yeah, so much for the introduction.
you came here to listen to his talk and I give the stage now to Michael Potente. First of all, thank you, Professor Baum, for the really uh, kind introduction. I feel humbled by, yeah, by this uh, introduction. And, uh, but most, of, most importantly, I'm actually quite excited to be now part of the Berlin Committee. It's, it's great to be here and to be yeah, a, a, a colleague of the great scientists in the Berlin area. So um, what I would like to do today is to share with you some of the, the concepts we are interested in and uh, some of the research that is still kind of basic biology oriented, but which we think provides a great uh, uh, soil for future translation. And uh, I will come to this at the end of my presentation. So as you uh, probably know, the, the growth and development of the bus blood vasculature is intimately linked to the metabolism of the tissue it supplies, regardless of whether this tissue is uh, a developing part of an embryo as shown here in this picture or a pathologic abnormality such as a tumor. Now, our laboratory is interested in understanding the cellular and molecular basis of this uh, linkage by focusing on the cells that line the inner surface of blood vessels, the endothelial cells. Now, we try to understand how uh, these cells sense metabolic signals and how they relay this information to uh, form new uh, blood vessels of organ-specific size, shape, and function. We're also interested how changes in the metabolism of these cells eventually control the growth and differentiation of uh, the vasculature and, and tissues. Now, but before I go into the details of some of our, our work, I would like to uh, actually acknowledge the, the team behind the work that uh, did uh, all these studies. Uh, really a fantastic and uh, ambitious group of scientists which uh, really enjoys to work as a team and which is highly ambitious. So all the credit goes to these young individuals. So one of the reasons why we're interested in the linkage between um, metabolism and uh, blood vessels is uh, very obvious, is, which is, and this is because uh, nutrient, tissue nutrient and oxygen deprivation is a primary signal to form new blood vessels, a process generally referred to as angiogenesis. Now, instructed by growth factors that are secreted by a nutrient and oxygen deprived tissues, and the theal cells break out, of the break out of the quiescent wall and start to sprout to eventually form new blood vessel networks. Now, we learned over the past year that, that this process is highly dynamic. And uh, uh, this is actually work from numerous labs around the world including the pioneering studies by Holger Garrett, who is also part of the Berlin community. Now, as I said, this is a highly dynamic uh, process and requires endothelial cells to coordinate the behavior such that only specific cells will stay at the top of, at, at the tip of a sprout and guide new vessels while others stay behind, proliferate and form a lumen. Now we learned that uh, one of the key pathways that coordinates these endothelial cell behaviors is the, the notch signaling pathway. And the current belief is that endothelial cells at the tip or at the top of an endothelial cell sprout, they have lower notch activity. And these cells, by upregulating uh, notch ligands, which instruct following cells to become followers of stalk cells and uh, through the upregulation of uh, a notch signaling. Now, notch signaling, as you know, is a evolutionally highly conserved mechanism that involves the ligand dependent cleavage of the notch receptors and this uh, cleavage then releases a, a fragment the so-called notch intercellular domain or NICD which functions in the nucleus as a transcriptional cofactor to drive the expression of prototypic target genes. The work of our laboratory has contributed to uh, this area of research particularly trying to understand the, the, how the dynamics of notch signaling are regulated during angiogenic growth by identifying several mechanisms how notch signaling is regulated at the molecular level. For instance, we found that the notch intercellular domain is uh, tightly regulated by reversible acetylation, a protein modification that is or that signals nutrient sufficiency. More recently, we also identified a protein that controls the lifetime of the activated notch receptor, a protein called ubiquitin-specific peptidase 10 or USP10. Uh, USP now, uh, according to our work, 
uh, uh, we would like to suggest the following model that this protein USP10 interacts with the activated MARCH receptor in the nucleus where it removes ubiquitin uh, proteins from the activated MARCH receptor and thereby opposes the rapid uh, uh, ubiquitin de degradation of these otherwise short-lived proteins. And you can see here just a few snapshots of this work. So if you knock out these, these peptidase in endothelial cells with CRISPR, you can see here an increase of the, in the uh, endogenous ubiquitination of this potent transcriptional cofactor. And in mice, if you knock out this uh, protein or this gene specifically in endothelial cells during development, you see phenotypes that are consistent with a decrease in, uh, in, in endothelial notch activity giving rise to these hypersprouted uh, endothelial cells here at the angiogenic front. However, we also learned in the past years that endothelial cells, for them to form new blood vessels, they not only need to coordinate their behaviors as shown here in this uh, simplified scheme, they also must coordinate uh, their metabolism or their metabolic activity. And this is because the angiogenic process is in fact highly metabolically demanding. Angiogenic endothelial cells require not only uh, required nutrients and energy not only for their motile behavior, but importantly also for the synthesis of, bio, uh, of building blocks such as amino acids, DNA, and lipids that are required to make new cells. Now this means that endothelial cells, when they get activated by growth factors such as VGF or others, they must increase their or must adapt their metabolic activity or even increase their anabolic metabolism to enable angiogenic growth as shown in this scheme. However, this somehow generates an inherent problem for the angiogenic endothelium because as I mentioned, blood vessels typically form in tissues that are oxygen and nutrient deprived. While most cells or most parenchymal cells will demise under such conditions or become inactive, endothelial cells actively migrate, proliferate, and differentiate, uh, uh, suggesting that they are somehow able to, to, to uh, manage or to, to function in this hostile environment. This also uh, suggests that endothelial cells somehow must have a highly regulated or even specialized metabolism that allows them to grow in challenge or to grow and expand in challenging tissue environments. Now, it turns out that uh, uh, the metabolism of endothelial cells is fairly peculiar, and I just want to provide you one of the examples for these uh, for the uh, for for the differences uh, of endothelial metabolism. So, for instance, if you look here at how uh, cells use glucose as an uh, energy substrate, you will recognize that most parenchymal cells will break down, will take up glucose uh, into the cells and break down glucose to pyruvate to then shuttle these uh, intermediate into the mitochondria to efficiently generate uh, ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. Only under conditions of oxygen limitation, these cells will uh, produce lactate to sustain energy production. Endothelial cells, on the other hand, uh, although having uh, uh, access to ample oxygen in the bloodstream, they will produce large amount uh, of lactate, um, although again having immediate access to oxygen in the bloodstream. So this raises the question, the fundamental question, why do endothelial cells use such a metabolism, which from a bioenergetic point of view is uh, relatively less efficient because it generates much less ATP. Now it turns out that a glycolytic metabolism uh, provides several advantages just for the endothelium. And these are advantages because the endothelium has also highly specialized functions. And I just want to name here a few. So by using glycolytic metabolism as a primary source to generate energy, energy endothelial cells use the most abundant extracellular nutrient for, uh, for ATP production. It also, uh, or this type of metabolism also allows uh, endothelial cells to produce ATP rapidly, which is certainly important for cells that dynamically sprout and grow in, uh, uh, in uh, nutrient-deprived tissues. It also, uh, particularly important, is the fact that glycolysis not only provides ATP, it also generates, interme it generates intermediates that can be used for the generation of cellular building blocks that are necessary for cell growth and proliferation. And perhaps the most important point, glycolysis does not require oxygen to proceed 
and such it allows cells to uh, to uh, sustain and uh, tissues that have fluctuating fluctuating oxygen levels now work from our laboratory uh, suggested that the metabolic activity of endothelial cells is tightly coupled to the activity of a transcription factor called forcat box 01 or fox01 uh, and we found that foxo critically regulates uh, the uh, the metabolic activity when endothelial switch between quiescence and close and just to remind you that endothelial cells are fairly plastic cells that can dynamically uh, um, switch between these states when they become activated uh, for instance for instance by uh, growth factor signals now uh, foxo one belongs to the family of foxo transcription factors so these are highly evolutionally conserved uh, uh, for instance in and in c elegans they promote longevity, but they also are uh, expressed in, in, um, uh, in mammals and humans. And uh, they, in fact, are critical regulators of cellular homeostasis. So when activated, these transcription factors typically uh, induce a cell cycle arrest that promotes stress resistance and they regulate or promote catabolic metabolism. Now, being a very potent group of transcription factors, these are also highly regulated. And among uh, the, the pathways that control FOX activity, particularly the PI3 AKT pathway plays a dominant role. So activation of these pathway, for, for instance, by VGF or other uh, cues, insulin or, or other factors, will lead to the inactivation of FOXO because AKT phosphorylates phosphor, FOXOs on three defined residues leading to their nuclear exclusion and thus uh, the, the shutdown of FOXO transcriptional programs. Now we found that endothelial cells are exquisitely sensitive to changes in, uh, in FOXO1 activity. And here is just one example where we knocked out FOXO1 constitutively and endothelial cells during uh, early development. And we found that this is not compatible with novel development as these uh, mice die around E10 and a half. Now, interestingly, FOXO1 is not confined to the endothelium. It's actually expressed in almost all tissues. Uh, and the knockout of these uh, and or these, the phenotype of these FOXO1 uh, and the specific knockout phenocopies that of the global knockout already indicating that there is somehow a specific sensitivity of endothelial cells to, to this to changes in this transcription factor. And you will see throughout the talk, we believe that it's perhaps actually the metabolic interface that plays uh, that endothelial cells uh, are exposed to that may define why they are so sensitive to changes in FOXO uh, signaling. So here's just another example from the postnatal mouse retina where we uh, bypassed the early uh, uh, embryonic lethality through tamoxifen inducible deletion of FOXO1 in endothelial cells. And here you can see that inactivation of these transcription factors in fact leads to a hypoplastic and dense vascular network that lacks here angiogenic sprout at the front. And you can perhaps appreciate this better when you look at this close up where we also stain the nuclei of endothelial cells. We can really appreciate these of this overgrown vasculature with this hyperplastic nature, indicating that FOXO1 as a transcription factor is absolutely is essential for vascular growth and that it functions to restrict or to coordinate or to limit angiogenic growth, trying to ensure that the, the, the process is, is coordinated. And so such when you inactivate FOXO, uh, this results in uncoordinated and even chaotic vascular overgrowth. Now that this is indeed the case uh, was also shown from studies where we uh, looked at the consequences of FOXO activation in endothelial cells. And here we used a mutant that uh, uh, harbors mutations in the three AKT dependent phosphorylation sites. So these are serine to alanine mutations such that FOXO cannot be phosphorylated by AKT and that, and that it stays in the nucleus. Now when you express this mutant in specifically endothelial cells, you will see that this results in the opposite phenotype a phenotype characterized by uh, a poorly vascularized and oh, oops, sorry uh, and poorly connected vascular network with thinned and hypercellular vascular branches now all in all these data suggested that uh, perhaps foxo is a key driver of endothelial quiescence i'm mentioning quiescence here because we did not find evidence in vitro or in vivo that these cells uh, are under are experience cellular uh, distress so we really believe that this phenotype is a consequence of a halted uh, growth response. 
so, so a lot of work which I'm not able to, to present because of, of the shortest of time um, uh, suggests that a critical component of this uh, mechanism is in fact the transcription factor CMIC and we have found that FOXO1 uh, uh, in fact suppresses the signaling and transcription of MIG uh, to uh, limit uh, antigenic growth and to promote a quiescent phenotype. Now, MIG, as you know, is a, is a potent regulator of cellular growth and proliferation, uh, which uh, drives anabolic metabolism in order to uh, prepare cells for growth and proliferation. And the potency of MIG uh, was actually revealed through collaborative, collaborative studies with Klaus Hayevsky's lab, who gave us a conditional uh, gain of uh, overexpression allele of MIG. And you can see here the consequences of MIG overexpression in endothelial cells, where and the theory restricted uh, expression of uh, wild type MIG results in a massive overgrowth of, uh, of the vasculature, where essentially the entire retinal endothelium turns into a sheet of, of, of cells, clearly highlighting the potency of this transcription factor and also the need to control the activity of this uh, protein uh, uh, in during angiogenic growth. Now, with all these data, well, we uh, would uh, uh, propose the concept here that the antagonism between FOXO and MIG, which is uh, also, as shown by others, a very important other types of cells, and particularly in cancer cells, um, uh, is important for the switch between quiescence and growth. So and endothelial cells, which become activated uh, by growth factors such as VGF through the VGF receptor 2, um, MIG is active. And in these cells, MIG will drive anabolic metabolism, growth, and proliferation. And FOXO, uh, likely as a consequence of PS3 AKT dependent signaling is inactive and resides in the cytoplasm. However, in cells that are more in the remote part of the, uh, the vasculature, the part that uh, will become quiescent, FOXO relocates to the nucleus and then signals and drives the expression of genes that will restrict mixed signaling, for example, MXA1, or uh, will induce the expression of FBW7 in E3 ligase that targets MIG for uh, proteasomal degradation. And in addition, it directly represses transcription of the MIG gene, uh, really setting a roadblock towards MIG activation and thereby enabling uh, um, uh, the adoption of a quiescent endothelial phenotype. Now, with MIG being a potent regulator of, uh, um, of metabolism and a potent driver of endothelial metabolism, as shown by our studies, this also suggested that perhaps an important component of adopting a quiescent endothelial phenotype is the regulation of endothelial metabolism. But we were not, uh, it was unclear what the real specific metabolic changes are or that occur in endothelial cells with uh, activated FOXO. So we decided to look at this and to look at this in an unbiased fashion by uh, performing an unbiased metabolomic screen where we used human umbilical vein endothelial cells as a model. And these cells were transduced with a control virus or a virus that uh, um, encodes for the constitutively nuclear AKT insensitive FOX1 mutant. And so uh, we took or collected the metabolites of these uh, cells up to 24 hours, hours and looked at the metabolic changes that occurred in response to FOX activation, with the idea that we perhaps could also infer uh, molecular or metabolic changes that occur in cells that are uh, uh, about to become quiescent. And you can see here that uh, endothelial cells with activated FOXO are quite metabolically distinct from control cells as revealed here in these principal component analysis. And we found in fact that uh, uh, numerous metabolites of branch chain amino acid metabolism and uh, early metabolites of the TCI cycle were particularly regulated in uh, uh, or upregulated in uh, endothelial cells with activated FOX1 signaling. Now, but there was one metabolite that really got our attention, and this was a, a metabolite uh, which is abbreviated here as 2-HG or 2-hydroxyglutarate, which was in fact the most regulated metabolite in this data set. Now, this metabolite got our attention because 2-hydroxyglutarate uh, is, is not used in intermediary metabolism. It rather functions as a as a signaling metabolite. And this is uh, due to its uh, structural similarity to, to oxoglutarate or alpha-ketoglutarate. So the current belief is that 2-hydroxyglutarate, due to its structural similarity to this um, uh, TCI cycle metabolite to oxoglutarate, that it functions as an inhibitor of enzymes 
that require two oxyglutarate as a substrate. And among these enzymes are and, uh, and, or proteins that control histomethylation, DNA methylation, or even proteins that control uh, the stability of HIFs, so-called boryl hydroxylases. So this raises the possibility that FOXO, by regulating uh, the levels of these uh, potent small molecule metabolite, might exert potent effects on uh, endothelogenic expression or uh, even on chromatin configuration by altering the levels of uh, these, this metabolic entity. However, uh, the, the biology or the metabolic bi biology is a little bit more complex because there are in fact two enantiomers of um, uh, two hydroxyglutarate. On the one hand, the R uh, uh, enantiomer, which has been uh, discovered initially in mutant uh, or in cancer cells, uh, carrying mutations in uh, enzymes called IDH1 and 2, leading to millimolar levels of these metabolite. Uh, however, there are also uh, also normal cells or normal differentiated cells can produce trihydroxyglutarate, but these cells primarily produce the S enantiomer called S2HG. Uh, and it turns out that this enantiomer is the more potent uh, enantiomer if you look for the impact on, on two oxygen dependent dioxygenases, the enzymes that I showed you in the slide before. Now we found that um, FOXO activated endothelial cells preferentially produce the S enantiomer enzyme s enantiomer of 2-HG, as shown here in this bar graph, uh, which was also the more uh, abundant metabolite in, in these cells. So the obvious question was then, what is the physiological function of S2-hydroxyglutarate in the epithelium? So I just want to give you here some snapshots of our analyses. And one of the uh, initially you know, uh, uh, our unexpected observations was, here that when we incubated endothelial cells, which cell permeable uh, versions of S2 hydroxyglutarate, we observed that these cells uh, failed to proliferate, as shown here in these cell counting curves. And we, in, when we initially did these studies, we were quite puzzled about this observation because, as I mentioned in the uh, slide before, the R enantiomer had originally been described as an oncometabolite. So we were puzzled, you know, how can this be that, that this metabolite, which is predicted to be uh, to, to promote cancer or certain types of cancer, how can this arrest? Uh, cell proliferation. And this got us really into this and uh, because the effect was so robust, uh, so we wanted to know what's really going on at the, at, at the cellular level. And it turns out that um, endothelial cells, when they are exposed to this metabolite, they really are arrested in the G1, G, uh, G0's G1 phase of the cell cycle. And this is also shown uh, was, or was revealed by studies where we looked at the transcriptome of endothelial cells treated with either uh, the solvent, DMSO, or the S enantiomer of 2-hydroxyglutarate, where we found that, in fact, the most or the uh, affected category of genes were genes uh, controlling cell cycle progression uh, and uh, cell growth. And so you can really see here, after 24 hours of incubation, we saw vast changes in gene expression, also highlighting this concept that this metabolite has an important role in controlling um, various transcriptional regulators. Now, that it's not just a kind of a, a stress response of cells uh, uh, that cells kind of are arrested in the G G0, G1 phase was shown also revealed by gene set enrichment studies where we found that uh, in fact many of the genes that were regulated both up and down regulated were genes that are associated with cellular quiescence and these were not only genes uh, uh, or cell cycle related genes but also prototypical genes uh, of the quiescent phenotype which already gave some indication that this is not a stress or a senescence response, but really a metabolite that might control this switch from a, a proliferating to a quiescent state. So we wanted to test this hypothesis in vitro first, and we used here a cell cycle reporter uh, called FUJI, which enables you to look at the dynamics uh, of the cell cycle um, uh, in uh, live cells. So these uh, cell cycle re reports are labeled cells in G1, G0, G1 phase in red fluorescence and cells in the S, G2 or M phase in yellow or green fluorescence. And we designed the experiment in the following way that we treated or used control or s 2 g treated cells, watched them for 48 hours, then removed the medium uh, and then watched them for another uh, 48 hours. You can see here one example in control and s 2 g cells. You can see the mixture of green and red cells clearly indicating the dynamics of the cell cycle. And consistent with our prior studies, we saw a depletion or a decrease in green cells in the S2HG group, 
However, when we removed uh, the S2HG from this environment, we found that the green cells reappeared uh, in, under this culture condition, um, highlighting this notion or providing further evidence that this metabolite rather controls quiescence than senescence. So we, we looked much deeper and also found uh, other characteristics of a quiescent phenotype in cells exposed to this metabolite, such as uh, lower metabolic activity, reduced RNA content, as well as reduced protein synthesis, which all in all led us to the following model that in conditions of FOXO activations, and this, uh, for instance, can be uh, cellular crowding or the deprivation of uh, um, uh, certain growth factors, that this leads to the production of these potent small molecule metabolite to S2 hydroxyglutarate, and this metabolite somehow promotes the adoption of a quiescent endothelial state. So we wanted to have more evidence or more support for this model, and so we uh, went uh, into an in vivo model here, the postnatal mouse retina, where we uh, used postnatal day five mice and injected the uh, metabolite into one eye and the control uh, solvent, DMSO, in the other. And then we uh, looked two days later at P7 at the extent and patterning of the vascular network. And here is what we got. So you, on the left, you see here uh, uh, an image that, as you have seen before, a postnatal uh, uh, mouse retina stained for ERG and PCAM labeling endothelial nuclear and the entire endothelial body. You can see this nicely patterned vascular networks formed of arteries, veins, and a more immature capillary plexus at the front. Now, uh, the S2HG injected uh, retinas showed here a, a quite dramatic phenotype, particularly at the angiogenic front. This is the region which grew in the last 48 hours. Uh, and you can see here that you really have a, a hypercellular and poorly connected vascular network, uh, and, and which likely is a consequence of impaired cellular proliferation as shown here in this slide, where the number and frequency of EDU, ERG, double positive cells, so really the proliferating endothelial cells, was decreased, uh, supporting our concept that s 2 is a potent metabolite that somehow plays a critical role in how endothelial cells uh, uh, um, go through the, through the cell cycle, and it itself then limits a cell cycle progression. So the question was, of course, how does FOXO induce the production of s 2 hydroxyglutarate so, uh, in particular because there are no mutations in any of the genes we use in primary endothelial cells, so these are not cancer cells. So um, I don't want to guide you through all the data here, but just come up with first with the model to, to facilitate uh, uh, the, uh, the understanding of this data. So all in all, our data suggests that this transcription factor FOXO1 induces the production of s 2 hydroxyglutarate um, by limiting the activity of an enzyme, a mitochondrial enzyme, an enzyme of the TCA cycle that is called 2-oxyglutarate uh, dehydrogenase or OGDH. Now this enzyme typically or uses, not typically, but it uses 2-oxyglutarate uh, or, or alpha-ketoglutarate uh, and produces succinyl-CoA. And we found that inactivation of this enzyme results uh, in the production of S2 hydroxyglutarate, because the accumulation of 2 hydroxyglutarate uh, of 2 oxyglutarate uh, then leads to the promiscuous usage of other enzymes that produce S2 hydroxyglutarate. And you can see here some of the data. So when you deplete OGDH in endothelial cells, you can see here this substantial and preferential uh, generation of this metabolite. And these are primary uvics. And also, if you knock out OGDH in endothelial cells uh, here consecutively uh, in during development can see that this is not compatible with normal development and also postnatally uh, in this tamoxifen induced system we see that these OGDH um, eliminated cells are unable or fail to proliferate it as indicated by the uh, really dramatically reduced number of EDU ERG positive cells which are shown here in yellow. So with all with these and, and several other pieces of data we uh, think we have identified these mitochondrial enzyme OGDH, which is part of the CTTCA cycle, as somehow as a, as a metabolic checkpoint that controls uh, the, the, the endothelial cell cycle. And we think that FOXO, by controlling the activity of these enzymes, can uh, influence whether 2-oxyglutarate is used in the TCA cycle to support energetics and biomass formation, or 
whether it is used to produce the signaling metabolite S2 hydroxyglutarate to promote uh, quiescence. But you may say, okay, of course, fine, this is all nice, but look, you, you deplete or you disrupt the TCA cycle. So of course these cells will not proliferate because this is essential uh, for, for normal cells to, to survive. Uh, to, to get an idea uh, whether this is indeed the case, uh, we uh, depleted the expression of two other enzymes of the TCA cycle, um, in this case, SDH or succinate dehydrogenase or fumarate hydratase. And we did this by CRISPR. You can see here that this worked fairly nice and compared this to the uh, effects of OGDH inactivation. And surprisingly, we found that uh, um, OGDH deletion led to the uh, induction of S2 hydroxyglutarate as shown in the previous slides. However, these other two enzymes, SDH and fumarate hydratase, um, did not have any impact on the production of these metabolites. And also surprisingly, these cells just proliferated fine. These, they had no problem whatsoever, while the OGDH inactivated cells uh, arrested their cell cycle. Now this also somehow uh, not only suggests that OGDH is a critical regulator of, of uh, endothelial cell cycle progression, progression but also, um, highlights the role of, of mitochondria or the special function of mitochondria in endothelial cells, which rather appears to be important for, for signaling rather than for the classical energetic role that is uh, important in other types of, of cells. Now, um, so all these data, some uh, suggest that boxo transcription factors are critical regulators of, of uh, the quiescent endothelial state and uh, as I showed you, this involves, of course, uh, the, um, the, the repression of mixed signaling as shown by our previous studies. And this is, uh, uh, of course, an essential part of these works. But we believe that through these studies that I just showed you, uh, we have identified another layer of how FOXO transcription factors promote the adoption of a, of a quiescent endothelial uh, state. And this is through the direct regulation of endothelial metabolism. So I did not go into the mechanism how this occurs, but we actually think that this, uh, the, the inactivation of OGDH is not a direct transcriptional mechanism because we did not find any changes in OGDH expression in, in, in the field sets that either lack or overexpress FOXO. Instead, we found that FOXO induces the, uh, or induces the catabolism of branch chain amino acids, and in particular uh, catabolites it's uh, called uh, KMV, KIK, and KIV, which are known inhibitors of these enzymes. So it appears that this is not a direct transcriptional mechanism, but rather uh, through the production of another source of metabolites, which then control the activity of this enzyme. And importantly, we also found that uh, the branch chain amino acid catabolic pathway is really a, a hotspot, or that numerous of these uh, uh, of these enzymes controlling uh, the, the breakdown of these. Um, amino acids are direct bona fide FOXO target genes. So this then suggests that FOXO really controls uh, the quiescent endothelial cells to a multi-layered mechanism. Now, we think also that these data um, reveal a metabolic program that supports the adoption of a quiescent state. And this um, demonstrates also that metabolism is not just a bystander of angiogenic signals transduction, but it that it itself has an important instructive role during uh, a growth and function. It also highlights the importance of metabolites as signaling molecules in the endothelium. And this is shown here by the identification of S2 hydroxyglutarate uh, in the adoption of a quiescent endothelial state. So this brings me to the last slide to really thank the people who did the work, uh, just a group uh, of people, of young motivated people who really, uh, it's great fun to work with these and it also these guys work fantastic in the team. So without the, all their contribution and ambition, all this work would not have been possible. Um, but also uh, our friends, colleagues and collaborators uh, around the world. I wanna really highlight here Holger Gerd who has been uh, instrumental for me as a, as a scientist, also when I was younger. Uh, and we still have lots of things in common and work together on various aspects of vascular biology. Also want to highlight here the contribution of Christian Fretzer, uh, who, um, with whom we did a lot of the metabolomic studies and who is really a fantastic cancer scientist, but numerous other scientists here who, are, who provide, again, tools, reagents and expertise. And last but not least here, uh, the funding bodies, which also provided us with the means
to provide uh, to conduct such uh, such studies. And this brings me to the end of my presentation and to and to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael Potente. We are proud to see the BIH on your last slide already. Uh, this is really beautiful uh, work that opens uh, completely new insights into highly conserved pathways. And maybe I can take the privilege of uh, being here the um, organizer of this series that um, to ask my question, the, one of the beauties, but also a challenge in the system is the ubiquity of both the cells and the pathway um, that you are addressing. And uh, so um, this is, of course, if to, in my understanding, the basic pathway regulating winter sleep and quiescence also in organ resident stem cells, tumor stem cells, and other conditions. So how can one target this really to the point of interest that is important in vascular diseases? Um, do you have any ideas how to um, have an actionable target at the, at the site where the disease really uh, is um, um, most pronounced for the patient? Um, I mean, I think these are uh, very important points you, you address here. Uh, and I just want to also, uh, again, re reiterate that foxes are not endothelial-specific proteins or genes or also some of the other proteins that I, or genes that I talked about. So, um, but for foxos, it's, it's quite interesting. So um, although they are widely expressed, I mean, I, I guess almost every cell expresses these factors. It's, it's really about two cell types where these transcription factors are important and, or where they are exquisitely sensitive, where, where cells are exquisitely sensitive to changes in foxo. And these are immune cells, particularly T cells, and endothelial cells. There are other cells which also where foxes play a dominant role, no, no question about that. But if you look at the, uh, the knockouts, these cells uh, uh, sh show the most dramatic phenotypes. So um, I think that what we, what we can take uh, from these uh, studies is that, um, that perhaps if one has tools to manipulate these factors or some of the downstream signaling, one might be able to perhaps transiently or in a, in a restricted fashion, control the signaling of, of such, such factors. But of course, uh, uh, it could be also, I mean, as you know, transcription factors are, uh, uh, it's in, they are inherently difficult to target because they don't have an enzymatic pocket and the surfaces are usually large. So finding molecules that might uh, target these proteins might be very difficult or, or even impossible. However, they are also now, uh, developments, there are some small molecules which have been described by several groups that appear to, uh, for example, interfere with the ability of FOXO to bind DNA or some molecules which block the activity. And uh, if with the emergence of no these new developments of molecular glues, there might be ways that one can transiently uh, uh, block the activity in a certain condition where you will have, for instance, uh, you know, excess of FOXO signaling. Uh, so that might be a, a way. Uh, whether this holds true, one needs to, to see, but I think these are all interesting research questions. And even if it would not turn out to be therapeutically relevant, one can likely under, uh, get deep insight into uh, the physiology that, or pathophysiology that drives certain states or some of the states. And the flip side of that observation is that I assume that there are many stem cell biologists who are approaching you with your models now uh, manipulating this pathway because it should be highly relevant as I said, for organ homeostasis and stem yeah. cell maintenance. Yeah, 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 right. Okay, so we have a question who came, which came in by the chat function. Holger Gerhard um, has a question for you. So he says, beautiful work. In addition to developmental switching between growth and quiescence, there is a profound heterogeneity between endothelial cells. Uh, recent work suggests that endothelial tip cells are preferentially recruited to form new arteries where their environment, gene expression, and likely metabolism should be totally different. Does your work on FOXO1 explain why tip cells rather than stalk cells are destined to form arteries? Uh, I, I think uh, Holger always, ha you know, he has very smart questions. And he's right. actually, we, we're thinking uh, exactly along these ways. Because as you might remember from one of the last slides I showed, these, these FOXO knockout phenotype 
so mice that lock like FOX one, three, and four in endothelial cells, they have these uh, these vein-like phenotype. So we we somehow think that these transcription factors are importing important for for the decision in endothelial cells to make either arteries or veins. And we think that FOXO inactivation is important for making veins, while FOXO activation might drive the decision or might uh, enable uh, the decision to uh, to make uh, uh, endotheles become arteries. And based on the on uh, on work uh, from Rui Benedito and our in Madrid and our own work, we, we actually think that metabolic changes are a substantial part of this uh, um, decision, such that endothelial cells that want to become an artery must rewire the metabolism in order to make this transition. Um, still, this, is, uh, uh, this data is mostly derived from uh, looking at uh, uh, phenotypes, mouse phenotypes, and we need to work further on, on the molecular details but I think uh, this is truly a, a fascinating concept and we're trying to work further on these, these ideas. Okay, I, I would like to encourage the audience to submit more questions uh, through the chat function. I have one more. If you have now an actively proliferating endothelial um, compartment, that is, uh, let's say, under the MUC dictate, and you would then um, come in with a strong intervention that enforces quiescence. Uh, would that really induce quiescence or can it also lead to apoptosis because of a signaling conflict? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, of course you're right. I mean, uh, biology is, or physiology is not that simple and uh, this can also occur. We also saw that, for example, uh, by studies where we uh, looked at the forced expression of MIG, or if we mutate MIG in a way that it's even more active because it cannot be degraded, that this can become, to become toxic for the cells because they, they just uh, we interpret it as that they somehow activate some checkpoints and they perhaps run out of fuel. So, you know, of course, it, it's not just this, uh, this black and white situation. Um, so, uh, it, this kind of work will require also, you know, uh, more, you know, there will be other components that feed into these mechanisms that ensure that uh, cells will maintain uh, um, uh, kind of, you know, or will maintain in a homeostatic range and not undergo apoptosis. What kind of signals these are, we don't know yet, but of course this is interesting also from a kind of a, yeah, a translational or, or disease point of view, because this might, uh, might provide insights what, you know, what might go wrong in certain disease states where we do not have adaptation of cellular behaviors, but rather a maladaptive response. And um, I think looking at these kind of uh, uh, yeah, scenarios would be uh, very interesting. Good, great. <clears throat> so I have a couple of more questions that came in. Thomas Blankenstein asks, what is similar, dissimilar in tumor, neoangiogenesis and retina, especially with regard to FOX01 ex uh, expression? So, uh, so the question is, what is, what is uh, the difference between pathological and, and developmental angiogenesis? I mean, um, uh, I mean, uh, clearly one aspect, but it's just one out of many, is uh, the uh, the cycling environment. In a tumor, you really have uh, excess levels of certain cytokine growth factors. The amounts of VGF that are secreted by by tumor cells is, is completely different towards, uh, compared to a normal uh, developmental environment. Environment. So this makes also the process completely uncoordinated. And I think Holger Gerd has also beautiful work to show that. Uh, excess levels of, of VGF, for instance, lead to a synchronization and, uh, of endothelial cell behavior such that they are unable to, co to coordinate the, the sprouting and, and uh, growth and proliferation. And then this might lead to these abnormal vascular phenotypes that you, that you see uh, in, uh, in tumors, uh, which is characteristic of, of uh, particularly of solid tumors. So um, we, we, but there might be other intrinsic features and these might be also due to the metabolism uh, tumors, the acidic environment, the hypoxic environment that might then lead to changes in uh, even their epigenetic uh, configuration. Um, uh, this needs to be looked further. But what is interesting, I think, is that perhaps, be uh, because if you look at the phenotypes that we observe in this developmental model, they somehow also are reminiscent of a pathologic uh, uh, or a tumor angiogenesis uh, this response that you see in, in certain types of cancers. So one could also uh, uh, think along the lines that FOXO inactivation 
is perhaps a, a central driver of tumor vessel abnormalization. And uh, maybe this is something which one could also exploit in the future, trying to think of ways how to normalize vascular responses in, in, in a tumor environment. Okay, thank you. Let me just remark, we have between 80 and 100 um, people in the audience of this talk, so there's a great interest, obviously, in your work. So Stefan Gross is asking, uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. I was struck by the role of BCAA in the regulation of this pathway. BCAA have also been correlated with development of diabetes. Given the role of vascular disease in diabetic states, is anyone investigating a potential connection? Um, you know, I, you know, I didn't show the data yet. We, we also were, were struck by, by the data, and we, we stumbled into this, uh, into the role of branch chain amino acid, because we were really desperately looking for the mechanism of how FOXO controls the activity of uh, ODDH. And it was, and then we, we, we just recognized that FOXO activation has this profound impact on on branch chain amino acid, acid catabolism, and uh, and so. Like like we like others uh, didn't have any clue about this this metabolic pathway, but we found that in fact it has uh, quite uh, potent effects on endothelial cells. So we did a, lo a lot of studies like bathing endothelial cells in different catabolites of branch chain acid uh, amino acid catabolism, and found that this has really potent effects on endothelial proliferation. So these catabolites they actually also halt the endothelial cell cycle. So there is there is really a, a, a very potent uh, biological uh, or metabolic entity here that needs to be looked at in much more detail. Having said this, I think that the, the biology or, or the passive physiologic role of this metabolic pathway is still poorly understood in the vasculature. There's good work, I think, for in hematopoietic stem cells and other types of uh, metabolic tissues. But in the vasculature, this is, I think, uh, really un, um, or unknown territory. And uh, given the role, for example, of foxes in diabetes, I think this is something also interesting where one might uh, speculate that, for example, a pathologic activation or uncontrolled activation of FOXOs in uh, diabetic states, for instance, might also lead to uh, a deregulation of such um, branch and amino acid uh, dependent pathway that might also lead to derailed vascular responses uh, in such environments. But of course, you know, we have looked at this, but I think this is a, a fascinating area which uh, should be looked at uh, in the near future. Good. We have a few more questions, and I think they're all really interesting. So to the audience, please stay online. I think it, it's really good to follow. Uh, Thomas Kamatones um, is asking, some tumors produce 2-HG. Would that affect tumor endothelial cells in a paracrine fashion in their proliferation? Mm -hmm. uh, a very good point. So. Um, we, we also see uh, that endothelial cells, that the S2HG from endothelial cells, at least in vitro, uh, can be secreted from endothelial cells. And this then uh, raises the possibility that this metabolite might also signal in a paracrine fashion. However, one needs to know that this metabolite per se cannot uh, go through, uh, go enter the cell. It requires a receptor. Um, that, so, for example, in our studies, we used a, cellular, a modified version of S2-hydroxybutyrate to look at the cellular effects. Um, whether the, the whether this kind of paracrine signaling is relevant in, in the vasculature or in other types of tissues, we have not looked at this from a vascular point of view. But I think there is studies um, from uh, Tegetmeyer and colleagues who showed that uh, in uh, a mouse model uh, of uh, where they overexpressed IDH one mutant, I think, that the, the millimolar levels of r 2 hydroxyglutarate can have an impact on the on the uh, on cardiomyocytes. And I think these mice, they develop kind of heart failure as their uh, cardiomyocyte function becomes impaired. So there is evidence for, for such a role. Um, however, the receptor that would uh, mediate the uptake of this, uh, this metabolite in other types of cells, I think uh, they still, still uh, work, there still need, needs to be uh, Still, studies need to be done in this direction. There was a study uh, from Heidelberg uh, that identified one receptor. Whether this is really uh, the case for other uh, cell types, we don't know yet. But uh, truly, uh, uh, a direction which is exciting and should be looked at. Thank you. So, Michael Schupp is asking: um, tox Foxo transcription factors become quite dysregulated in insulin resistance, at, at least in the liver. Might dysregulated FOXO in insulin resistance type 2 diabetes 
also contribute to impaired angiogenesis in these patients? Yeah. Um, so we have not uh, looked at this, but I think this is uh, uh, absolute uh, possible and would be logic if you look at our data. There's also, uh, there was a recent study who looked in uh, some um, um, uh, di diabetic models at the role of FOXO signaling, and they used loss of function models uh, that would indicate such a role. So uh, personally, I believe that such signaling mechanism is operational, but I think it has not been shown yet uh, in, in detail. So, um, but it would certainly make sense, particularly given the role of, of FOXOs in, in insulin signaling. And uh, just to remind you that uh, FOXOs were initially discovered uh, downstream of insulin receptor signaling. So I think this seems to me highly likely. Good. Another question is from Narashima Telugu. Um, do you think heart tissue specific endothelium dif differentiation requires metabolites from heart? Um, if so, do you think co-culturing of cardiomyocytes with endothelial progenitors promotes tissue specific endothelial differentiation? Uh, I mean, in this case, I can only speculate, but I think there's, I mean, now a lot of data suggesting that endothelial cells uh, are important for the differentiation of, of or specific organs uh, because these endothelial cells or these organ or these organotypically differentiated endothelial cells provide growth factors or, 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 growth or cell surface receptors or molecules or matrix proteins, so so called angiocrines, that then co determine the differentiation uh, and or growth or differentiation of, of uh, cells, of such cells. So I think uh, endothelial cells are a key component in, in, in such differentiation programs. And one, uh, if one does such, such studies, one should certainly have a look at the contribution of endothelial cells. But we have not done yet any studies in that direction. Um, but we are certainly interested in, in the idea of, of how uh, changes in tissue metabolism or how cells in the tissue environment influence the uh, specific, specialization and organ specific differentiation of endothelial cells because endothelial cells as you know are although they they are endothelial cells in every organ they are uh, highly differentiated in each and every organ to uh, kind of adopt uh, organ specific functions however the molecular basis for this is still poorly understood and so we are also interested in, in, in the impact of the tissue or the organ on endothelial cells but i guess there will be also a reciprocal signaling uh, taking place Okay, just for your interest, we still have more than 60 people online, but we should, I think, conclude by quarter past one, the latest. I still have a few more questions. If you're still ready to go, we, sure. the next one sure. will be by Philip Mertens. Um, transcription factors like FOXO1 or metabolic enzymes like OGDH are heavily modified by post-translational modification. Um, are there any druggable um, PTM, post-translational modification modifying enzyme, enzymes that could be targeted with small molecules to modulate FOXO1 or OGDH function? Oh, that's a very, very, very good question. So uh, um, FOXOs are, uh, let me start first with FOXO. So FOXO, uh, FOXOs in general are, they are not so much regulated at the transcriptional level, but really at the post-translational level. And they are really a hot or a hub for modifications. So they are phosphorylated, acetylated, methylated, uruconated, you name it. So, and, and they, there's also, there's this model that you have a kind of a FOXO code of modification that determine the, the cellular output. So um, we are also interested in that uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the idea to having ways to modulate uh, the activity of this pathway. And we are particularly interested in uh, the ubiquitin side or aspect of this. And we have work uh, that is uh, fairly advanced showing that, um, that there are, there are particular deubiquitinases that control the activity, not the levels, but the activity of FOXO, uh, deubiquitinases that control a particular type of ubiquitin chain. Uh, and interestingly, these deubiquitinases are also direct FOXO target genes. So one could envision that by regulating the activity of these dubs, and the, you can target them because these have an enzymatic function, um, one would be able to, to modulate a FOXO activity in a more a specific fashion. Um, but there are, of course, numerous other uh, uh, pathways which uh, uh, control or regulate FOXO responses. But this is also something we would like to, to look in much more detail uh, 
it would be great actually to work uh, uh, with Philip Mertens in this direction uh, to really to to identify uh, the, the limiting uh, or the most important pathway that control fox activity because I think this is still poorly understood. We know that the PI3 kinase, PI3 kinase, uh, PI3 kinase AKT pathway is important, but uh, what is really the the input that activates FOXO uh, that is still poorly understood. And uh, based on our work, we would guess that this is not the passive phenomenon, but that there are pathways that actively control FOXO activity that activate it and not just inactivate it. And maybe this is due to a, a post-translation event on FOXO. Uh, for OGDH, it's true that it is, uh, this is also protein that is um, um, uh, modified by several modifications, in particular phosphorylation. We, we also have an interest in to look at the this complex. It's not just ODGH, but there are two other proteins forming this enzyme. And it's possible that, that changes in these modification control or alter the, the activity of these enzymes and particularly important is, for example, lipoylation. Um, but they are also already inhibitors of OGDH. Uh, I think even in clinical trials, uh, a compound called CPI613, I think, uh, which is supposed to be uh, to be a fairly specific inhibitor of uh, OGDH. Uh, and um, I think this is perhaps an interesting uh, molecule to work further and to be able to reversibly inhibit the uh, activity of this enzyme in in certain disease models. Yeah, with respect to the compensatory, uh, compensatory pathways, here's a question of Martinez Reyes. Uh, have you explored if modulating NAD plus levels rescues the phenotype of FOXO activation? Uh, uh, this we have not done yet. We, um, we know that FOXO activation um, uh, changes the, uh, uh, the NADH to NAD to NADH ratio. So uh, this leads to more um, or less reductive environment uh, favoring uh, uh, essentially uh, the formation of S2 hydroxylurate. But we have not done any studies or any rescue studies trying to see uh, what kind of impact this has on, on, on FOXO. Uh, uh, would be interesting to do that. Uh, we will put this on our to-do list. Okay, and the final question then would be by Klaus Rajewski. Um, in germinal center B cells, Mutant nuclear FOXO1 is a lymphoma driver. Any comment? Yeah, um, I mean, this uh, uh, not excluding that in other types of cell, FOXO, nuclear FOXO might have other function or might even be an oncogene. I think there's also uh, other types of cancers where FOXO has been suggested to to promote to promote uh, um, uh, tumor formation. So it, it's really a, a, a a dual, uh, uh, there are two sides of the coins. I can only speak now for, for our work in a physiological context where we think that FOXs are really primary regulators of cellular homeostasis. But um, as I think this is true also for other kinds of signaling molecules, for example, if you look at the notch pathway, um, notch activation is uh, considered uh, or is an oncogene in several uh, types of cells, while in the theal cells, notch activation is also promoting uh, coalescence and not uh, cellular proliferation or oncogenesis. So I think it really depends on the cell type and uh, the, the response of a cell to a certain transcription factor or pathway activation. Um, I, I, so likely uh, FOXO is not, uh, based on the data, uh, this suggests that uh, uh, the responses are, are just different in different types of cells. Okay, I think this is now the time to conclude.